everybody's a little bit wrong about Antifa. That's the topic of this week's video. I'm Ryan Morrow from the Clarion Project. So President Trump is saying that he'll designate Antifa as a terrorist group so that they can all be locked up. Some say that they agree that Antifa is a terrorist group, but that we can't actually designate them as a terrorist group and do that. Some say that they are bad guys, but they aren't necessarily terrorists. Some say that Antifa are actually the good guys. And some say that Antifa basically doesn't exist. They're just a name. So let's look at what the truth actually is. Let's start with what Antifa is. The name Antifa means anti-fascist. Who could oppose that, right? The term comes from a communist group in Germany in the 1930s that was linked to the Soviet Union, opposed to both the capitalist Democrats and the Nazis. Later in the Cold War, the name Antifa started by being used by activists who would go to places and physically attack people that they felt were white supremacists or actually were white supremacists in Europe. And their argument was that in a free society, hate speech can spread. And so the only way that you can stop the appeal of white supremacism is through violence. So in their mind, their violence was self-defense because hate speech was equivalent to them being physically attacked. However, it wasn't ever just about fighting white supremacists. Like I said before, they were full of communists and anarchists, even though they had the name of anti-fascist, Antifa. Broadly speaking, they opposed the West and believed that it should basically be burnt to the ground. Groups and people began identifying as Antifa in the United States in the mid-1980s, particularly in the area of Minneapolis. Today, Antifa does still target white supremacists, that's true, but they call pretty much everyone they disagree with a white supremacist. As a result, they threaten people who aren't actually white supremacists and condemn white supremacists. So people who are just conservative pundits or Republican politicians or are pro-police or belong to the police or anyone associated with the structure of power is viewed and treated as a white supremacist by Antifa. Antifa is basically violent political correctness. Within Antifa, there are three essential elements um, that sometimes get confused. First, there are violent actors who riot, attack police, and show up to events where they think white supremacists are and they pick a fight. Civilians, police, and private property are put in harm's way as a result of that fight. Second, there are nonviolent members of Antifa who dox people they don't like by exposing their private information online so that they can be harassed, stalked, or even attacked. This part of Antifa aims to basically terrorize people nonviolently and ruin their lives by getting them fired from their jobs, unable to be hired, and jeopardizing their privacy and therefore their safety. Third, the people who identify as Antifa don't really know the group's history and somehow think they can dis distance themselves from the violent act. So there's people that just hear the term anti-fascist and say, hey, I like that. I don't like fascism. I'm anti-fascist. And then they adopt the title and then they kind of continue on with their lives of prideful virtue signaling uh, and showing off and trying to get attention by saying, hey, I'm anti-fascist. And that's the extent of their involvement. So now let's sort out this issue of whether Antifa can and should be designated as a terrorist group. Are they terrorists? Undoubtedly, yes. Antifa plots violence for the sake of a political ideology that is a blend of anarchism and communism. Regardless of what individual members may or may not believe, that is the founding principle. That's what their literature talks about, what their social media pages talk about. It's a blend of anarchism and communism and essentially trying to overthrow the U.S. government and the U.S. system. So it's violence for the sake of a political ideology. They are a terrorist group. There's an Antifa guide out there that was published and distributed that instructs supporters to get every legal weapon that they possibly can, learn how to use it the best way possible, to get regular martial arts training, and to never cooperate with the police for any reason. They're told to never even condemn another Antifa supporter or ally who might be doing something illegal, which obviously means there's some degree of illegal activity going on that they want to protect. So at its core, Antifa is a violent terrorist ideology. 
but are they a terrorist group? I'm seeing a lot of commentaries out there suggesting that Antifa is basically just a name or a hashtag that almost doesn't even exist because there isn't a leader or a headquarters that you can point to. And that's just wrong. They form local chapters, even if they're small, even if these chapters only have 10 to 30 active members who meet and talk and think similarly, that's still a group. And Antifa supporters meet online across the country. So that is a group. They communicate with each other and they do talk and organize to some degree. With today's technology, a group can exist without needing a hierarchy. They don't need a piece of real estate. They don't need a registered organization, but they are a group. Now, here's the trickier part. Can and should Antifa be designated as a terrorist group and therefore its members prosecuted simply for being supporters or members of the organization as President Trump talked about? Well, the United States doesn't even have a list of domestic terrorist groups who are banned like that. There is no list like that for them to be put onto, where basically if you support Antifa, therefore you can get arrested or thrown out of the country or something like that. The list doesn't exist. The State Department does have a list of foreign terrorist organizations. And the Treasury Department does have a list of specially designated terrorist organizations so that we can sanction entities overseas connected to terrorists. But again, we're talking about foreign operatives. If you live in America and you materially support those foreign terrorist organizations, that's illegal, and you can be locked up for that. But Antifa, as we currently understand it, is not a foreign terrorist organization. It is not operating under the direction of a leader overseas. What the Attorney General has said is that he'll prosecute Antifa-type extremists and anarchists who are, quote, criminal organizers and instigators involved with the riots. Notice that word usage. He wasn't saying he would just arrest any Antifa member or Antifa-type extremist. He was specifically talking about those who have that label and engage in a crime because you can't prosecute them for simply adopting that label. One option that might work and has been floated out there is designating Antifa-associated groups overseas as foreign terrorist organizations or transnational criminal organizations. That way they could be sanctioned, you could ban their members from coming to the United States, people who live in the U.S. couldn't materially support them, so that would be an option. If there's a group aligned with Antifa or identifies as Antifa and operates overseas, potentially some action could be taken. That would make it, again, easier to go after Antifa members in the U.S. who are working internationally. But, but what about those that are based in the U.S. and operate just domestically? It wouldn't actually affect them. Now, there's one other potential option. You can conceivably argue that Executive Order 13224, which was issued after the 9-11 attacks, could be used to some degree. The executive order uh, was used to freeze the assets of entities based in the United States who were believed to be financing terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and Hamas. So there was a list of terrorist groups and then charities and organizations that were thought to be financing them in the United States had their assets frozen. And then potentially there you could be brought up on charges. But since Antifa doesn't have an associated organization like a nonprofit or a charity in the United States, whose assets would you freeze? And how would it be held up in court? And really, what would actually change? Because right now, if an Antifa supporter finances an act of terrorism, that is a crime. And they'll be prosecuted for that if there's enough evidence for the person to be charged and for that to happen. The same goes for white supremacists. You can't ban neo-Nazism from America, but you can prosecute individual neo-Nazis for engaging in specific crimes. So yes, Antifa is a terrorist movement, but designating them as an actual terrorist group with some sort of leadership and infrastructure is another more complicated and difficult matter to contend with. As of right now, based on what we know publicly, doesn't seem like that could be done, but that could change. They could develop a leadership. They might have a leadership that's hiding. 
Uh, so all of these are the facts that we're dealing with just as we know them now. Now, one last point. As to whether Antifa orchestrated the riots entirely, partially, or not at all, we have yet to see proof right now that Antifa orchestrated the riots. According to a leaked FBI report, there is no evidence of Antifa involvement, at least at the time that the FBI report was written and distributed. For me, it's really hard to imagine Antifa not getting involved in the riots because that's the sort of thing that they live for. The purpose of the organization is to get involved in things like the riots, at least after they begin. They're supposed to jump in there. So we'll know more about that in the coming weeks. We don't have to make a determination now. I think it's most likely that they're at least a little bit involved, if not directly organizing it. But remember this, Antifa would love nothing more than for all of us to get the impression that the riots were completely due to them, as if they're that powerful. Extremist groups love hysteria and exaggerating their own power. I want to ask everyone watching this to do two things as you watch the media coverage uh, go on as there are more riots. Next time that you hear about riots or hateful protests, go on social media and look at the pictures and look at the videos of the respectful, peaceful protests that are happening. Ones where police and protesters are talking to each other and they're actually building relationships. Something positive is actually happening. And I've got to tell you, when you look for that, you actually make the effort to look for it as opposed to just getting, taking what's delivered to you through the television set or on social media, you'll be surprised at how many examples are of this happening. It's widespread, it doesn't get much coverage. After you do that, there's a second thing I want you to do. I want you to pay attention to the footage on TV of the riots and of any hateful portion of the protesters that are causing a problem, especially the helicopter footage. Take a look at that. I want you to look at the area around the troublemakers and behind them especially, not just the criminals and not just the haters themselves. Look at the area around them so you get an idea of what their numbers actually are. Notice what it looks like when the camera pans out instead of just zooming in on the small collection of rioters or hateful protesters. Look at that broader view. Then you'll get an idea of what their real numbers actually are. In several of the places where riots were happening, I was watching the TV just like you were. And I assume that the crowd of rioters continued past the view of the camera, that we were dealing with just a tidal wave of them. But then when I saw the broader view, I realized that their numbers were much smaller than I had been led to believe. The truth is that with all this massive amount of tension building up in the United States around this issue, the violence and hate could have been much, much worse than it actually was. The number of peaceful protesters far outweighed the number of rioters. And in fact, in many cases, the peaceful protesters confronted people who wanted to riot and destroy property. There were far, far more constructive interactions between the police and the protesters than the clashes that we all saw on TV. We must acknowledge and combat extremists and violent criminals, of course, but let's not give them an ideological victory that they didn't earn and that they don't deserve. Never let our society's fixation on conflict and negativity, our TV network's desire for ratings, and our social media's algorithms mislead you into pessimism and despair. If you take a broader look at the situation and you dig a little bit deeper for the facts and the context, you'll see that America is still that shining city upon a hill. I'm Ryan Morrow from the Clarion Project. Thanks for watching.